The other day I was messing around with jump nodes, trying to create something similar to this animation by Hixas. And while I didn't end up recreating the exact effect, I did stumble upon something in the same vein. The setup I ended up with turned out to be super fun to play around with, because you can essentially use any object that you want as the base for it, and it's extremely easy to reuse. So in this video, I will show how to create this morphing grid effect with jumped nodes. With the default cube selected, head over to the jumped nodes workspace and add a new node tree. First, let's create a grid that we can instantiate objects on. What I want is a 10 meter by 10 meter grid of 1 by 1 meter cells, but I just want edges to align with the x axis and not the y axis. So to do this, I will use two mesh lines with a count value of 10. Set the offset y value of the first mesh line to 1, and the offset x value of the second mesh line to 1 as well. To create the grid, add an instance on points node, and use the first mesh line as the points input, and the second mesh line as the instance input. This instantiates the second mesh line on each of the points of the first. And lastly, to turn this into real geometry instead of instances, add a realized instances node. This step is important, otherwise any distortions we add to the geometry will be applied to the lines as a whole, instead of the individual points of the lines. Before adding any distortions however, let's instantiate some objects on the grid. For the effect to work properly, there are some things to keep in mind. Firstly, any object that you want to use should be 1 by 1 meter in size, since that is the size of the cells of the grid we made. Secondly, the objects should cover the entire 1 by 1 meter area, otherwise there will be gaps or overlaps between the instantiated objects. This isn't always the case though, since sometimes you want a gap depending on the subject matter, as in the case of this grid of keyboard keys with rounded corners for example. And lastly, the origin of the objects needs to be centered at the bottom of the object, since that is where the instantiated position will be calculated from. The objects I will use as an example are these keyboard keys that I made from beveled cubes. To access them in the node tree, drag the collection containing your objects into the node tree. This will add a collection info node with the correct collection selected. The reason for using a collection info node instead of an object info node is that it allows us to use more than one object. Just make sure that both separate children and reset children are enabled. Add an instance on points node. Connect the grid that we made to the points input. Then connect the collection info node to the instance input. Also enable pick instance, so that the instance on points node only uses one object for each point. Now this will give us each object in their order in the outliner, in a repeating fashion. In some cases this might be what you want, but for this example I want the distribution of the objects to be random, and there is a pretty easy way to automatically randomize the order independent of the amount of objects you have in the instance collection. Add a domain size node, and set it to instances. Then connect the collection info node to the geometry input. The output of this node will now be the number of objects in the collection. But since index values are counted from 0 instead of 1, we need to subtract 1 from that number by using a math node set to subtract. And lastly, add a random value node set to integer, and connect the subtract node to the max input. Then connect the random value node to the instance index input of the instance on points node. If you aren't satisfied with the resulting distribution, you can change the seed in the random value node to get a different one. Before moving on, I will add some more variation to the look of the grid by adding more objects in the collection. So here I've added two more white keys, so that I have three times as many white keys as I have orange and black keys, which results in this color distribution on the grid. So now that we have the objects placed on the grid, let's distort the grid to create the morphing effect. After the Realize Instances node, add a Set Position node, a Combine XYZ node, a Map Range node, and a Noise Texture node set to 4D. 
These are the values I will use for the noise texture, since I like what the resulting distortion looks like, but feel free to try different values. Connect the factor output to the value input of the map range node, then change it to a min value to negative 1.25, and the to max value to 1.25. Connect the map range node to the x input of the combined XYZ node, since we just want to distort the grid on the x axis. Then connect the combined XYZ node to the offset input of the set position node. Now when we change the W value in the noise texture, we will change the grid distortion. And we can automate this by adding the scene time node, and connect the frame output to the W input. This is way too fast by default, so add a math node set to multiply, and set the multiply value to something small. Now this value is dependent on your frame rate. I have my scene set to 60 FPS, so in my case 0 0.01 works pretty well. So now that the grid is being distorted, we essentially just need to scale the objects based on the distortion, and since everything is based on 1 by 1 meter cells, we can use the resulting lengths of each edge in the grid to scale the objects. First, let's make it so that the objects are instantiated on the edges of the grid instead of the vertices. To do this, add a mesh to points node after the set position node. This allows us to convert either the vertices, edges, faces or corners of a mesh to points, and the resulting points will be positioned at the exact center of their respective parts. So by setting the mesh to points node to edges, the instances will be placed exactly in the middle between two vertices. Now we just need to stretch or shrink the instances to fit the new distorted widths of the grid cells, and we can do that pretty easily. First, add an edge vertices node, and a vector math node set to distance. The position 1 and position 2 outputs will give us the vector positions of two vertices connected by an edge, and by using the vector math node, we can get the distance between those two positions, which is equal to the length of the connecting edge. So now that we have the length of the edges, we can use them to scale the instances in the x-axis by using a combined XYZ node. However, after we convert the edges to points, we no longer have access to those lengths directly. So in order to save the lengths for use after the Mesh to Points node, we can capture them with the Capture Attribute node, and use that as the X value. At this point, we can add some extra style by adding some variation in the C direction as well. For example, the length value used for the X scale can also be used for the C scale to make the instances grow and shrink in the c-axis. Something else we can do in my case is to simulate the look of someone typing on the keys. To do this, I will use a translate instances node, and a combine xyz node, and use the factor output of the noise texture we use to distort the grid as the c-value. To turn the gradual up and down movement of the keys into something more snappy, I will add a math node set to snap, with an increment value of 0.5. I will also add a multiply node with a value of negative 0.25 to make the keys move slightly down instead of up. So with a grid of instances in place, Let's add a final touch where the grid is scrolling seamlessly. I want the entire loop to be 10 seconds long at 60 FPS, so I will set the end frame to 600. The way I will create the seamless scrolling is by duplicating the jump nose object and moving it 10 meters down on the Y axis. Then I will add a keyframe for the location at frame 1 for both of the grid objects, Set my current frame to 601, move up both grid objects 10 meters on the Y axis, and then keyframe the location for both of them again. Now the only thing we need to take care of is the grid distortion, 
since at the moment it will not appear to be looping. To fix this, I will add a frame offset to the setup, so that the second grid at frame 600 will have the same distortion as the first grid had at frame 1. In the node tree, after the scene time node, add a math node set to subtract. Then drag the bottom value to an empty output in the group input node. Press N to open the property sidebar and rename this new input to frame offset. Now we can set the frame offset value in the modifier of the duplicated grid to 600, which will achieve what we want. Of course, the offset value is dependent on the amount of frames you use in the timeline. So if you're using, let's say, 250 frames, the frame offset value would be 250 as well. And that's about it. Once you have this set up, you can easily create endless variations by changing the objects in the collection used in the node tree. And even mundane things looks pretty cool when presented like this. So I hope you found this video helpful, and that you learned something new. See you next time.